Fellow team players, it's not a good week in Steeler Nation. There is a lot of problems here in Pittsburgh, and I'm Acra sure you want to stay tuned to hear what we have to say. This is Local Football Flavor. Welcome to Local Football Flavor, where we talk to local fans to get the real information on what's going on with their team. Beautiful intro, Bob, and it is ugly out there today. Um, oh, man. So, all right, I'm there. I can't, I, I can't go back there. I mean, I, I mean. I, I'm in the middle of breaking down the strategies of football of it, so I, I have. Here's the thing. Like, I'm sitting here doing work on, um, on Sunday. I normally like to go see, like, open houses on Sunday because I'm trying to buy a house. But, mm-hmm. like. I'm sitting here watching this game and I'm thinking to myself and and you, and you know, you know, at the beginning of the season that I was a Mitch Trubisky truther and I Mm -hmm. still kind of am. I I am no longer now I'm breaking down the film of him. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing, I'm seeing like, I'm seeing some things and then I'm not seeing a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And then, and there's a lot of issues in his quarterback play. There was a lot of issues in general, but what, I'm really upset about what I've been trying, what I've been tweeting out to, um, you know, on Twitter with, with, with our, um, with uh, football flavor here is I've been really getting that Matt Canada, man. Like oh, yeah. ever since he's been on this team, this offense has looked monumentally worse oh, yeah. than it should. And the, the fact that, these quarterbacks look better in a two minute drill when they're making decisions. Mm-hmm. They suck the rest of the game and you're not letting them make decisions. I mean, yeah, part of this is on Mitch Trubisky and part of this is, 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 is that, but this is like whatever the highest tier, th- like threat level or like, Whatever it is, like DefCon Five, this is DefCon Four, DefCon Five. I don't even care. This is it. This is this yeah. Is it. Because, like I said in our show at the beginning of the year when we first started our first episode ever, is that this team has been carried by the defense, and what mm-hmm. happens when the defense can't carry them? And you have seen it in successive weeks. The defense is not able to hold it. T.J. Watt isn't there. T.J. Watt adds so much to this team that people don't mm-hmm. even think about. Um, seven or have seven times and, without him, seven losses. And it, it's it's just it's just incredible, Joe, to think that we're sitting here. And I said in our first episode, I believe I said the Tampa Bay game is the linchpin of the season. If they don't have a certain amount of wins by Tampa Bay, it's going to start to get ugly in the middle of the year. And I don't even think at this point in time that they could even beat Atlanta. And I was very yeah. confident. Well, Atlanta's a lot better than we thought. I mean, in and Atlanta's I don't even defense. think that they could beat Atlanta. And if we looked at their schedule like we did, um, I'm thinking that maybe they'll beat Indianapolis. Probably. Um, mm-hmm. But something needs to happen. And Canada, Canada needs to go. Well, on that note, strategies of football, as long as a ton of the shorts are going to be broken down about exactly that um so yes i don't know if i i said this on local flavor if i did on someone else's show or not um we got we got to go back to to when canada got hired and why canada got hired when it came down to ben after losing that playoff game to cleveland sitting there on the bench with pouncey and both of them crying Ben decided he wanted to come back and Pouncey chose not to. I'm wearing the Pouncey jersey. I love Pouncey. But the point was the Roonies didn't want to ostracize another Hall of Fame quarterback like they did the Bradshaw. The Roonies looked at this as a lifelong decision rather than a two-season decision. Both Colbert and Tallinn didn't want Ben back, but the Roonies weren't willing to fire them. So they did this idea we will hire the person he hates the most in the building who was the quarterback's coach to be the offensive coordinator. And maybe that will make him quit. Hence the Matt Canada regime was born. And since then, everything you just said was true. The Ben told us in every post game press conference 
Our offense was the worst offense in football with Ben for the first three quarters of every game. We were constantly coming from behind. And then the fourth quarter, Ben could run the no huddle and do what he wanted. That's all 100% true. It's well documented. And the answer flat out was, well, then why did we keep Canada? And the long story short was because we wanted to have some stability as we were changing out of the Hall of Fame quarterback. And the real question is, if stability is important, let me correct this. What is more important, having stable bad results or inconsistent great results? And that was the question they had. So they they ended up choosing stable bad results because they knew what Ben was or they knew what the Canada offense was. And in preseason and training camp, they are doing motion like crazy continuously. They do two kinds of motion whenever they run in a normal game. They do the tight end starts next to the left Mm -hmm. tackle, moves to the center and goes back to the left tackle, which shows you effectively nothing. Or they run a receiver across the formation and 90% of the time they do that, that guy gets the ball, either directly handed to him or on a little swing route three seconds later. What I feel like incredibly predictable. What I feel like the Matt Canada offense is, is like living in in Seattle or living in Pittsburgh and them saying, I have a 50% chance of rain in the summertime. Oh, no shit. Like, it's like when I see this and I, and I, and I see players, you know, it gets so frustrating to watch these games. And I know a lot of fans, and I know a lot of fan bases have been through this in the last five years, 10 years, 12 years, 15 years. But as Steelers fans, we haven't logistically experienced a team this consistently bad mm-hmm. in a very, very long time. Mm-hmm. Um, and you saw it in the first game against Cincinnati, I guess. And, and TJ Watt is the disruptor. He is the defensive MVP. A team MVP. And he's only played three quarters. Just like we saw with, Lam- just like we were talking about with Lamar Jackson with offensive MVP, you take him off the team, the team is much, 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 much worse. Mm-hmm. But they don't know what to do with him. The Steelers know what to do with TJ Watt. TJ Watt is the defensive MVP. Love he, me. Is, he, is, he, he eats, he's incredible, he gets pressure, he can do everything. And he gets so much pressure that it makes that back end defensive backfield so much better. Mm-hmm. Like, it makes Minka Fitzpatrick so much better. It makes the linebackers so – you could play um, – what's his name? The 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 rando linebacker that we had last year. What was his name? We had many of them. Which one? You, yeah, but the, the, one, the first one. The outside one or the inside one? The outside one. Ingram. No, the other one. That's not Ingram. Highsmith. No, the, you know who I'm talking about. It was just this random guy. Um Spillane. Those were our three outside Robert linebackers. Spillane. Spillane's Spillane. the inside one. You know, but you know. He also sucks. Every time he's out there on dime, they're targeting him, and he's but letting up big plays. This is what I'm saying. Like, why is he still on the field? When you have a guy like TJ Watt, it makes you be able to start a guy that shouldn't even be in the lineup. Yeah, but with that being said, if you have Miles Jack, why is Spillane coming on the field? That, that's be. my fundamental fact. And this, this gets back this gets back to the thing that I've talked about for years and years and years and years. We've go we've gone to team trivia. We haven't gone in a long time since the pandemic. Mm-hmm. But I've said this and I will go on record on YouTube to say it right now. Tomlin needs to go. No, nah, that's 100% wrong. I disagree with your sentiment of it. Tomlin needs to go. I am not looking at history. I am not looking at what you have done for me in the past. And this is something that Wisconsin in college football just went with. They fired Paul Chris. This is what a lot of teams are going with is what are you doing for me now? And what are you doing for me in the future? And if you are a head coach and you are buddy, buddy with the ownership and you are thinking through all of these things and you actively don't put up a fight, to get rid of Matt Canada and get he somebody chose else Canada. See, that's the thing. He chose Canada. He's not trying and to get rid of him. He problem. picked him. That is a, that is a, you know, we, we've all made bad hiring choices. That's I, an insufferable situation. And he should let him go. Yeah, but the, the thing is, is let him go. at this point in the day, there's nothing you can do about it. You you're can't, not going to be able to in, install a new offense. You, if you're as good as Tomlin says, he is, 
have somebody take over that's on the team. Have him take over the play call. Yeah, but there's not enough time during the week to create a new offense from scratch. There, they don't have an not... offense. It's so, easy to create an offense when you don't have one. Um, yes, it, it, they don't have an effective offense. The one thing Tomlin has done, and this Give is the undeniable. The offense. Well, no, it's actually they're not doing that enough. That's the what problem. they need to do. It's, it would help. But the one thing Tomlin has always done, and this has been true with every single one of his teams, is they are better each quarter than they were the quarter before. And he has gotten some absolutely miserable teams that if they were coached by Lovey Smith would be t- five picks into the playoffs. You know, he what have he done for me lately? He's gotten a quarterback who can't throw the ball five yards downfield into the playoffs twice. Year before that, he had a quarterback who didn't deserve to be on a practice squad get you to the playoffs. So three straight years, incomparable teams, he's getting them there. Now, it comes to a bigger question, why is the talent not being replaced? And they have turned over a ton of personnel on that defensive front seven. And, see, and, and they the have point. turned over the entire offensive line. They are try- it's not like they're not trying and, and not taking swings at it. It's just that not every swing is going to be what perfect. I want to know. No one does that. And this is really what I this is really what I would like to know is I would like to know how much of a hand he's actually he actually has in what personnel choices are being made and what what level, you know, because when I think of New England, Bill Belichick has command over what happens in that room. Mm hmm. Whatever happens, Robert Kraft says, go ahead. Go ahead, Bill. Do whatever you want. I trust you. They had a big fight about Brady at the end. But yeah. Right. And and he probably goes, hey, don't worry, Rob. We got this new guy coming in. I'll train him just like I did Tom Brady. Right? And Robert Kraft believes him. My question. Kraft didn't want Brady to leave. Right? My My question is, is that. Um, my, my question is, is that what kind of power does Tomlin hold within this organization? Because if he has shown and he has shown in the past, I'm not taking any, I'm not discrediting any of his past accomplishments with any other team. He, he, at this point in time in his career, he could be defined as a hall of fame coach. He is a hall of fame. He wins right? nearly two out of three games. So my question is, is as we look at the Steelers of today and of the future, mm-hmm. how much power and how much control does he have over the personnel that is being brought in? What power, what control does he have over the coaching decisions that are being made and how much of that falls to the ownership and how much of it is falling elsewhere? Well, because- it, it, Colbert has said that the Tomlin – has always had 100% control of his staff. That okay. anyone who's in the coaching department, Tomlin has had the choice of it. So if that's the case. And, and, and Colbert has the scouting staff. That, that's right? only if, divide the, the, the temple. If that's the case, and just like you said, they brought back in Canada to make sure that Ben left because they didn't. Which is the they, worst reason to hire someone. That, that's but my I'm saying. I'm problem. saying you specifically – told Tomlin, whatever, somebody in the ownership told Tomlin and said, hey, we're hiring Matt Canada back. We know he's bad. We trust you. We know you can make good calls. We know you can make good decisions here. I don't see, and this is the problem, I don't see Mike Tomlin's footprint on this team at all. I see it on the defense like crazy. Yeah. The the defense, this this has been the most... Um, inner turnovers we've had in years. They they are jumping routes. The, I mean, Sutton I think has three picks and another two that he dropped. Um, but it goes. It but that that goes to say, okay, so if he's get if he has his footprint on the defense and he needs somebody to be a footprint on the offense, we cannot go this year and another year. The Steelers cannot go three years in a row where Mike Tomlin's defense is the one of the best, if not the best, whatever in the league. Mm -hmm. And you have an offense that's in the bottom half of the league. You can't, you can't bring home championships like that. You have seen teams do it, but it's, it's, there's such a big disparity between 
what is it's not that the it's not that the offense doesn't have talent on it. That's the problem. Well, well let's talk about that cuz going into the season, our three most prominent pass catchers were going to be Johnson, Claypool, Claypool and Pickens. And, no, Pickens was a, he was a rookie. We no one was really counting on him. The third one was Muth. The third one was Fryer Muth. All I would argue them, that Najee, I would argue Najee. I'm in of the receiving core. That's tight ends. But yes, obviously Najee too. But of those three, all three of them dropped an interception yesterday. And if any one of those three don't. Dropped an interception, lose. you mean. They dropped an interception. Dropped the ball an hit off their hands, and then it went into a jet. All three of them did it. Johnson did on the first interception of the game. Claypool basically handed well, it Well, I mean, to I him. told you. And Fryer Moose just had it tip out of his hands. Right. Um, in our the fire was once the most the Jets, that that would that that would happen that the Jets that that's something that the Jets do they're opportunists well, that do the Friar Muth one is actually the most Canada failure of all of them because he has Pickens being three yards away from Fire Muth at the point of reception and it's actually Pickens guy that catches the ball. Right. Um, it's a hundred percent of Canada failure. Now here's um, the thing. Here's you'll the thing see that on drops. strategies of football by the way. Here's the thing about drops. So every receiver other than like, you know, the elite of the elite is going to have drop balls. And particularly when you, I don't know if they, I, I, like I said, I turned it off. I was so frustrated with it. So if it happened in the second half, then it happened with Kenny Pickett. Cause I know Kenny Pickett threw three interceptions. Kenny Pickett threw three. Yeah. He threw three. That's right. Um, it threw, so, the point is you don't win with four interceptions. No, no one wins like that. I get it. I get it. But what I'm saying is, is that if those interceptions come from tip balls or they come from drop balls or that it's in the bread basket and it comes down, you know, we're obviously, we're obviously looking at a team that doesn't have it together. They, they don't have it together. The offense doesn't have it together. They haven't had it together all year. They've faked like they've had it together in that Cincinnati game, but they really don't have it together. They were never really offensive in that Cincinnati game. No, what and, they were was a was a defense giving you amazing field position. When I look, when I look, when I look at the offensive talent of this team, is it is it in the top top third of the league? No. Um, is it in the middle? Probably um, somewhere somewhere along the line, um, second third of the league. Najee, yeah, too, that's fair. Najee is inefficient, but he's but he is talented. Deontay Johnson needs to have space, but he's talented. George Pickens is an animal. They need to get him the ball more. Claypool isn't as good I got as nine we wanted targets him. last two weeks. Right. I mean, Claypool, they're starting to get pick at the ball. Claypool isn't as good as we wanted him to be. He's not. Um, yeah, that's a fact. And and Frymuth can do can do what he does. And the offensive line is is also not very good. At this point in time, yeah, like, that is a hundred percent fact. You know, the, the the best player on that offensive line is probably Daniels and Chooks is number two. The right side, you you can watch it during the games when they run the ball. It, it, there's a correlation to this. I want to point out in the Jets game in particular, but when they run the ball behind o- Chuka Okafor or and Daniels on the right, they're vastly better. Now, most teams are better running to the right period, but in the Jets game in particular. It was whenever they didn't run at Quinton Williams. Uh-huh. Um, it was Blaine when they they just ran away from him because when he was over top of Dotson, our left guard, uh-huh. he owned him. He owned him the whole game. And there's gonna be some nice little shorts about that too. I, I, I I'm yeah. very pumped about these. But when when, um, when you break down the strategies of football about this game, you know. Mm-hmm. Your your way of viewing the game is much different than my way my way of viewing the game because you look at it from a very analytical standpoint. Um, and, and you and you sit there and you and you really break it down and you and you talk through these these things and it really helps me think how bad they actually are, right? When you an, when you analyze this team, I can't tell you how much I would. And I hate to say this, I hate to say this. Houston's offense looks a little bit better yeah it, it's getting scary like that and so there is a number of times where it is third down and they put four receivers in a formation and only one of them is across the line of gain mm-hmm. um, and i cannot tell you how insufferably frustrating that is 
um, that you know you need to get to the line of scrimmage and you are not even putting anyone past it. The other mm -hmm. thing that's true with this offense is that it's a lot of option routes, which means that they're expecting the receiver and quarterback to see the same thing on the field and then sit in the right spot of the zone. The problem with that is that, A, they have to see the same thing. And if they disagree, that's how you miss passes. The second problem with that is you tend to get two receivers sitting in the same zone, making it very easy for defenders to do it. There's a third down play. The one after um, Johnson steps out of the back of the end zone on, mm -hmm. on what would have been a touchdown where Johnson and I believe it's, it, it, it's the tight end. It, it had to be Friar um, are literally stacked on each other. Pre-snap. They run stride for stride with each other, 15 yards downfield and then turn left to right. There is one jet who just runs next to them the whole time, taking them both out of the play as they were the first read. Yeah. Which, by the way, their routes by themselves meant that they shouldn't have been because they were going too far downfield. It's a, um, it's it, it's it's an horribly elementary, designed. It's an elementary offense from an elementary um, coordinator. Who... No, it's not even that. This is a guy who doesn't know how the. This is basically if you were trying to teach handwriting to someone. And someone was writing the first syllable in cursive and the second syllable oh, in no, print, no, and listen, not thinking no. that was wrong. You, you, you have obviously never taught anybody how to write before, and I'm going to lay it down for you if you want to. Oh, talk we're getting to, backwards letters and stuff. If you want, no, 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 no. If you want to talk the ABCs of Matt Canada, what I'm saying is, when you learn how to write a letter and you learn how to write it in print, you go with a certain order. You go with letters that have sticks in them. You go with letters that have the same formation, like, okay, here is a C. Now I'm going to make it into an A. Now I can also add a stick to that and it becomes, uh, you know, a D, right? It, you have an O. Canada isn't even close to drawing a straight line. Yeah, dude, it's... Let alone talking about cursive. Cursive is monumentally harder than print writing. And when I say elementary, what I mean is pre-primer because he isn't even making letters yet. He yeah, is, it is he such is simply, a predictable offense. He's simply speaking things into existence and hoping beyond a shadow of hope that something sticks onto the wall. It's literally like putting a fly strip in your house and but, hoping that some fly ends up flying in there and hoping that you catch it. That's how bad this team is right now. And Colin Coward, and I and I don't like Colin Coward at all, but Colin Coward ranked a bunch of teams. And he said, the Steelers are in their own class. It's bad. Oh, like, yeah. He didn't even rank Detroit there. He didn't even rank Houston there. He didn't even rank the Bears there. The Steelers are a special kind of bad right now. Well, they are. Their best plays are the ones they're actually copying from the offenses that were run against them earlier. Um, and they're not even copying them well, for the record. Um, mm -hmm. they're, they're trying to run the toss play that New England ran successfully um, two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And again, you'll break it down in strategy of football about how they should have run it and how they didn't. Um, the Rams run a cut through tight end pulling play, which requires you to have a very strong point of attack at your guard to mm -hmm. allow the tight end to come through. We can't do that. I don't even know why we're wasting our time trying it. But the thing is, is that when you're giving Najee the ball, he is smart enough and athletic enough to know what he had. Najee is unlike Bell. Bell lived in a world where it had to be what it was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And he would take it to the max. Mm -hmm. Najee deals much more in reality of this is what I, ha I I can either keep going that way and I know it ain't going to work or I'll try this and maybe I'll get something. Now, Najee yeah. needs to accept the four yards. Is it an okay result? In the beginning of the year, he was only playing for home runs. Um, but what we saw last week, and there's a number of plays that were drawn and they failed, but Najee skittered into getting four yards out of it which is incredibly important i mean your running back needs to be able to do that but from a basic way to draw a running play abysmal failure and i've also noticing that it's not just carolina that gives away their passing plays 
when the running back is a yard behind it. That's a league wide pandemic now. Like, like everyone is having this problem. Mm-hmm. Like when you're your running back it lines up a little extra deep from the quarterback, it's almost always a run. And, and there are very few teams that just keep the running back a yard behind them as they should. Um, for two reasons. A, if you're doing pass protection, get a little momentum in there, hit the guy harder. Mm-hmm. Um, and second, don't give the damn play away, which is much more important. So it, it is vital, but it, it's becoming a thing around the league, and it, it, it's it's very frustrating seeing that. And, you know, again, if we can pick it up on film, there's no way that the defenses aren't able to see that as well. And, and that, we wonder why that, everything's that, getting jumped. Right, that goes back to it. It, it, it feels like, it feels like Mad Canada, and to that degree, I guess the quarterbacks coach and the wide receivers coach and all of those other coaches, it feels like, like I said, they're trying to see what sticks and hope against all hope that something works because they don't know what they're doing. They have no, they have no clue. Like you say, like if you know your team and you know your personnel and you have a guy like Najee Harris and you have a guy like Deontay Johnson and you have a guy like George Pickens and you're not – and this is what I said about Lamar Jackson. If you're not using that player to the best talent level that that player needs to be at and you are not giving them the opportunity to succeed, succeed you're not giving them the weapons to succeed, you're not giving them the coaching that they need to succeed, you are not going to be successful. It is impossible to be successful in that situation. And as a fan – and I'm sitting here, we have, what, 13 more weeks to go of this? Like, mm-hmm. it feels like with the schedule that we broke down at the beginning of the year, it really feels like there might be one or two winnable games on the schedule. And it and it's not a Kenny Pickett thing. Mm-hmm. It's not it, – it, it's, it's, it's an offensive thing where they're in such a rut with this coordinator. They're in such a rut with this team that – you got rid of Trubisky. You, you're not starting him anymore. No, he, he's out. You're not starting Trubisky anymore. Okay, that was. And your... Trubisky also made some bad decisions. I mean, yeah, his arm was is, not as good as I thought it was going like, to be. This is like if you're talking about a bank vault, right? That there mm-hmm. are different tiers of security. When your offense isn't working, the first thing to go is the quarterback. Okay. Yeah. The next thing, if it doesn't start working, well, the most teams, the first thing to go is a receiver. You get rid of him because he's crazy. No, so I'm that's what most teams do it. I'm In this right team, now, we did the quarterback first. This yeah. team. And a lot of teams too. Like, you know, if the quarterback, if it's not working, you change out the quarterback, you get you 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 put in whoever your your second is. See what happens there. Um, you know, Carolina did it last year when Sam Darnold was really, you know, whatever bringing in you see it with the borderline quarterbacks but in general what you see is russell wilson's not doing well so instead of throwing the locket now we're going to give the metcalf for a while yeah that's normally for good teams what you see when you're talking about the elite quarterbacks you're going to go and you're going to get a you're going to throw it to a different wide receiver you're going to game plan in a different way Mm -hmm. but when they're when your offense is struggling in the way that the steelers offense is struggling and it's it might be the worst, if not the third or second worst offense in the league right now. Um, and that's just from an eyeball test. If you if you look at what's going on, the next thing in the next two to three weeks, if Kenny Pickett is not doing well, or Mason Rudolph to that degree, if they decide that they want to go with him. Kenny's playing every game the rest of the world. Canada has to go. Uh, it's hard to fire someone midseason, but I can't tell you this is the, the it has this is happen. the thought that I've had and, and having run enough businesses, I, I think that there's some correlation to this, although I'm not in this room, so I can't prove it. He should be on a PIP plan. Well, what what normally happens that makes businesses fail is when a person of authority, like a offensive coordinator would be, is insecure about their decisions, they don't hire people who are economic or not economic, they're mentally stronger than them or different than them. They hire lesser versions of themselves. And that happens all over the place all the time. And what I'm seeing is intellectual insecurity with this offense. They're afraid to do something that someone would be able to point out and go, that was blatantly wrong and you'd get fired. And the culmination of that has decreased their potential for how high can get so much 
that there is no potential from the way that this is designed to come out. If you would go to the Rams and let him draw up this offense, we could put up 40 points a game. The mm-hmm. Rams don't have a good offensive line. Mm-hmm. The Rams have three, you know, these receiving core, while they're overrated as can be, they can actually do things. They can get open. Using the middle of the field is nice. Friar Moose was open for a couple of deep bombs. Just the way the plays were designed, it was the wrong read order. And it, it, to me, it, it's amazing that there are, there are very basic things that are wrong that are not corrected, but there's also so much potential that they're not even trying to attempt to achieve that they're just leaving in. I don't even know if they've ever even drawn it. It's it just intellectually never yeah, coming it's out. Not, it's not there. And when and to me, that, it's he's afraid of having someone on his staff that's better than him. When Canada made the offense a staff, and uh, you know, it, a lot of the player, a lot of the coaches got overturned, and Canada's people replaced them. And I believe part of the reason he these people were chosen is so that he knew they weren't smarter than him, so he would have job security. Well, and this, that is a horrible way to hire people. Well, this this is why this is why it makes me concerned. It shows. About- this is why it makes me concerned about Mike Tomlin. Now, like you said, you said his footprint is all over the defense, and the defense mm-hmm. really has no big gaping holes. Um, TJ Watt needs to come back so Spillane. that he can play better. Right? Spillane yes, and Ollie Spillane. Lalu are, are holes. Spillane, yes. But, you know, the defense has an identity. The defense is is mm-hmm. oh yeah is worthy enough to keep a team that, it can't eat, that has like 12 three and outs within – the first three, four games of the season or something like that. And almost all of them in the third quarter, which is an absurd number. But when you, when you look at this team and you said, you know, yourself with, with, um, with Canada, that you don't want to fill up your team with anybody that is smarter than you or better than you in a degree. It sounds like little fingers making this. (laughs) Right. It feels like it because I feel that Tomlin I feel like Tomlin gets in his way sometimes. And I've always felt this about Tomlin is that he is so two things. Tomlin gives you the freedom to fail, which most coaches don't, but he doesn't punish you for failing. That's possible, right? There's zero consequence for failure. Like when I think about failure and when I think about failure and I think about it in an academic mindset is that Mm -hmm. failure is fine but you need to learn from your failure. You can't continue to make the same mistake over and over and over again. And if you are making the same mistake over and over again, you obviously haven't learned what we taught you and we have to reteach you that, that thing. Um, or there's what something... happens when the teacher doesn't know how to teach it. This is the problem, right? This is what I'm saying is that when you build a team and when you build a coordinating staff and when you have these things happening and now you, you, you know, when it comes to academics, you can go and get an outside tutor if you so choose. But in 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 the football world, if you are building a team that you have zero, um, that you're 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 ineffective in, like he's good on defense, but he's clearly inept on offense and is really struggling to help. Well, he outsources it. I mean, he, he does. Really he treats it like he help Matt Canada, like Matt Canada. Is, is someone that, you know, if you hire him and, you know, he was a scapegoat at the time, but now he's actually your guy, what, why are you not helping him? Why are you not? Well, he, let's keep this in mind. If he, if he was hired because he was abrasive, um, that kind of arrogance is normally hard to have them change. But see, that's, and, you're basically that's asking Donald to Trump at. to not be arrogant. I mean, that, that's essentially what you're but telling me to do I'm right trying now. To get, that's what I'm trying to get at is that at, for Tomlin is that there is zero consequence for failure. And there is, he, he wants to be everybody's friend. He doesn't want to make an enemy with anybody. He doesn't. And he wants to be well, I'm everybody's friend. I'm not totally friend. sure about that. No, but listen, he, he definitely listen, likes to have listen, copious working conditions. Listen. It, copious working t- conditions are different when you when you're when you know your boss is the boss but your boss is still friendly that is a good working environment because mm-hmm. you know exactly what the expectations are you know what the consequences are for not doing your work you know xyz is going to happen and you're still comfortable because your boss still treats you like a human being 
Right? Well, he walked in at halftime and said, I don't care who you want to be quarterback. I'm putting Pickett in. Right. He but did do that. But this is the thing. You can't go three friggin' weeks with saying Mitchell Trubisky is my guy. Mitchell Trubisky is my guy. Mitchell Trubisky is my guy. And then walk in at halftime and go, Mitchell Trubisky, we think you're playing a good game, but we're going to put Kenny Pickett in. Like, uh, it was very apparent he was not playing a good game. <laughs> whatever. The, the point stands is that his decision-making, out he, he's outsourcing decision-making, and that decision-making is bad, and he is unable to correct mistakes because he doesn't want to make enemies and he doesn't want to not be friends with people on his staff and his team. The, See, I, I, I don't know about that no, second part because there's a giant true. difference about what goes on in there and what he portrays to the, the no, media. No, it's true. You can see it. You can see it in the locker room. You don't let something go as so far as Le'Veon Bell's situation went. You cannot go as far with what A.B.'s situation went. You cannot. Oh, no. A.B. was insane way before. Yes. Tomlin kept can't. that under wraps for a long time. You can't do that. There's He there's did do it. He did very good at it. That's he kept saying, A.B. Though. from being insane for That's like what I'm saying, though. three years harder than anyone else would have. But hear me out, okay? When when we're talking when we're talking about this and we're saying all of these things, you know, especially you know Juju too. When yeah, when you are and this well, is Juju's a, this, doing nothing. He had one game. He's right? been doing and, nothing the rest of the month. Yeah, exactly. And and that's it. Good for them. Good for them. You know that they that they that he's not a part of the team anymore, right? But mm -hmm. when I, back to my point about Tomlin is that. When you have when when there's really no consequence for failure, when there's really no um, when the when the expectation is win a Super Bowl, and you have gotten the team, you have never had a losing season with this team. This year will probably be his first losing. So season. he knows that's my point. Is he knows how to build a culture of winning. He's never had a losing, but a culture of winning that he's built, right? Mm-hmm. The first half of it was built on the back of the previous coaching staff who collected those players. Those players were disciplined in a different way. They had a different way of going you about it. You argue the first, this for, first Super Bowl he went to was right. that, not the second then, one. Then it starts to be his guys. Then you start to get veterans. Then you start to get talent. Then you start to get, you know, all that of that. That second stuff. Super Bowl run was his right? team. But now, through and through. But now you are getting older. Your teams are getting younger. Yeah. Okay. And so with the generation of talent that is coming through right now, I mean, we're in our thirties, right? Mm -hmm. But we're talking about people in their twenties, 20 to 25 range. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm short as all. So I, you know, I don't want to really be talking about like a, a six two, 275 pound linebacker right now, but I'm saying to a degree when you go through the college ranks and you come up and the the styles, player styles are different from different coaching staffs, obviously. Mm -hmm. But when you have a player coming in through Alabama, you are hoping that that player is disciplined, that they have these characteristics about them. And, I, you know, you could list a whole bunch of characteristics. Mm hmm. In college football, now that you have coaches jumping around, going in the NFL, going here because they're trying to get the money, going bing, bang, bing, bang, bing, bing, boom, the culture growing up in college is a lot different. Now you put those same players in the NFL that have varying degrees of discipline, and you put them with a coach who has zero consequences for failure. You're continuing to be able to play every single week, even though you're dropping balls, you're not making plays, you're not making decisions. Your team, over the lifetime of the next five years, if you don't get that corrected, especially if you're not getting that corrected on your staff right now where you have a guy that continues to fail and fail and fail and not fix it, you either have to change that or you have to decide to. I, I, Bob, there's a lot of what you're saying there is true and there's potential for a lot of pitfalls there. Absolutely. The, the, but the, there is some, some, some hard evidence against that too. A, if you are clearly better than the next option, he gives you more leeway because he has to, because there's not a better option to replace you. That's where we're specifically talking about Johnson right now 
dropping all the passes. Claypool never stepped up to become a number one, and he probably never will. John or Pickens was drafted because they don't believe in Claypool. They would be way better with a new left tackle instead of a third receiver, period. Mm-hmm. That's from pure roster construction. That's because they don't believe in Claypool. That's why Pickens is here. Now, that being said, everything about the potential of the thing breaking and imploding is true. But when we look at it, who when he looks around the staff in the room, who is the next best option to run this defense? Because you cannot bring an outsider in at this point. Um, that there's no way you can get get an outsider in. You mean around the it's, offense? Yeah. So so he, so you have to look at around the outside. And the starting point was Canada picked people he knew was worse than him. So rather than trying from a, imagine this is is if you were in if you were a starting running back in the NFL, you were allowed to pick who the rest of the depth chart was behind you. Basically, that's what he did. He made himself the starting running back and then picked junior college level replacements to be the backups behind him. So therefore he would never get taken off the field. That is what happened yeah. with the offensive staff this season. And, and that's I totally why I that. suspect a complete house burning of the offensive staff in the off season. I totally get that. But and there's nothing you can do about now. To the, We're point stuck. That I was, to the point that I was saying though, is that if you are in, stuck in such a quagmire, of a situation where you have what you have described and you do have what you've described. Tomlin as the coach, as the leader of the team has to step in and say, Canada, you suck. You're I'm making sure he terrible has. decisions. He probably has. And he's probably the type of guy that would say that, but he has to say, and he has to say, you, ha- I'm giving you the option to do X, Y, Z. However, if X, Y, Z is not done, these are the things that are going to, these are the things that I want you to run. And that takes a, and he's probably doing that. And I hope it, it that. could be the, that, yeah, he is doing that. That's why don't. I want to know what's going on behind the curtain, because is that actually happening? Because it's not translating on the field because he's such, he speaks with such brevity in his press conferences and he, he, and he, he intentionally shows, doesn't want us to know stuff, which is good. He, he, and he he, that's a very good emotion, skill of his. And he and he can talk to them, and, and you know, and and he, and that's really good from a media standpoint. Is that you know he's not giving a lot of information away and all that all that other stuff. Dude, it's just but, unfortunate. Every time they line up, they give it away. But exactly. So if I'm a person and I have a struggling person, if I'm a boss and I have a struggling person in my in my, you know, purview here is I'm going to give them all of the resources and information and skills that I have at my disposal. Mm -hmm. What this is telling me about Mike Tomlin is he has no idea how to run an offense. Oh, see, I I don't think that's true at all. What I suspect is happening is, is that the way, well, the way that you, you address this is with the normal employees, you put, you give them the, 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 the resources and then you ratchet up the pressure on them. So of what I expect, that's one way. If you're, if you're not doing this after 20 plays, you lose the next 20 plays of calling. You can still sit up there in the box and throw papers around and make it look like you're talking into the microphone um, or your headset. But we but haven't the the day, seen. We haven't well, you seen. don't. But the point is, you would never know that. But you would, because Canada is that bad. If Tomlin was even, even, even an inkling of a figment of an idea. Above Matt well, the most I, I guess what you're saying. So you when when Ben did it, he just went no huddle. Um, exactly. and, and, that, and that's what I'm saying is that Mike Tomlin, for the last, however, it feels like Big Ben was there for 13 years, probably the most injured Ben or like forever Ben, forever Ben. Like it's like yeah, it's like yeah, it was a very long time. And uh, Mike Tomlin, Mike it was Tomlin, like 13 years. Yeah. Mike Tomlin had Ben, Mason Rudolph. At one point, Bruce Gadkowski for a couple of games. Um, who else? Yeah, Landry has, Jones has started for him. Landry um, Jones Buck has started, started for him. Right. All of those guys had more competent offensive coordinators. So my that's not hard. Their college I, this co- I, but this programs had too. Mike Tomlin is a delegator as a boss. He's a delegator. When I say that I don't think that Mike Tomlin knows how to coach an offense, 
it comes from a place with hard evidence where he has never had to do it in the last 13 years of his life, even when those. Oh, that year there. that Ben was out when it was Duck and Rudolph, and he still got them into the playoffs. That, but they, did they he get changed... them into the? Did he get them into the playoffs, or did their offensive coordinator at the time get them into the playoffs? They changed the offense completely when Duck was out there. Um, it's actually the something they could do now. Who was the offensive coordinator? Uh, who the hell was it? It was the guy before Fickner. Um, forgetting who that was, uh, but it was the one before Fickner. Right, and Fichtner was chosen because he was Ben. Ben essentially hired Fichtner because he was yeah, Ben's it, best friend. Because he because because he let Ben do whatever he wanted and didn't yeah. basically didn't have to do anything. But this is that's the that's the point that I was getting to is that Mike Tomlin hasn't really had to coach the offense for a long time, or it hasn't looked like he. Yeah, has he, he did. It, most of his coaching of the offense was keeping crazy people and from so becoming completely where insane. Where you say where you say as a boss. You want to give them give them the 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 information, and you ratchet up the pressure. From my perspective, as a boss, I will give you the information. I will even show you some of these things and what they look like when I do it. It's a it's a I do, we do, you do. Yeah, it, it, and he it doesn't comes have from... the I do. He can't. He doesn't have the I do, or at See, least we haven't even seen that yet. See that that's the part I disagree with because th- there's lots of different ways you can go about it. You you um he he's letting them have the freedom to to operate in the space that they want. And the thing but is for- is the Canada sales pitch of what his no. his capabilities are oh, and what he no. actually puts on the no. field never line up. No. If you give the freedom to a bunch of chickens, the chickens are going to run away. If you give the freedom for 10 purebred pit bulls to go anywhere they want, they're not going to go anywhere they want. They're going to stay there. There is a degree to which I truly believe that what you're saying is completely accurate in a lot of situations. But this team, if you give freedom to people that to people that don't un, or to things or whatever, you know, like it doesn't matter if you give the freedom and they're they're not aware of what to do with that freedom of the offense it's it doesn't matter if you give them the freedom to do what they want because they don't know what they're doing yeah so going to some some particular yeah i can say words good some specific actual things that that trubisky did wrong that got him out of the game Trubisky arguably, t- not arguably, Trubisky took himself out of that game. There is a lot of patterns where Trubisky underthrows or is late on his reads. And that ultimately is Doug what was talked holding about this that team back. Trey Lance. Doug talked about that with Trey Lance way back. Yeah, no, and it, it was happening with Trubisky. And his arm also wasn't as strong as, as, as it was built to be. Um, he, there's a deep bomb in early in, in late in the first quarter, rather early in the second quarter, either one, um, going down the sidelines and Trubisky underthrows him by five yards and gives the defense enough time to come in because he put so much air under this ball. Mm-hmm. He threw a rainbow when he could have thrown a line drive and he's capable of throwing it. He threw mm-hmm. that same pass later in the, in the drive, mm-hmm. um, later in the game rather, and completed it. Like he, mm-hmm. he's capable of doing it. And it, it, it's outstanding about why it wasn't. And yes, was the line, is the line great? No. Um, but it's not as bad as he makes it look. He, there's a lot of his first read is being put at receivers that will not be open for three steps. Your first read should be at a receiver who will be open on the first step back, then second. Right. Step. And that's but design. A, I mean, that's, that's a, Canada design. But the thing is, when Pickett's problem. in there, Pickett, basically, you see him going to where the read should be on the play, regardless of how it's. Let me put it this way: there most no, most coordinators draw it from a specific direction. You either start at the sideline, and you work your way to the middle, or you start in the middle and you work your way to the sideline. What we saw Pickett doing was here, there, then there. So he was blatantly going to the far off one because he knew their route and where you would be open in relation. 
it does mean it's drawn wrong. It's 100% means it's drawn wrong. But he's playing with stupid cards better than Trubisky was. And that's all I can really say. When you're at a but poker see, table, comes, you, there's a way to lose with bad cards. That comes and I think from, Pickett's that better comes than from that. Pat Narduzzi. I, I oh, dude, you're, oh, I never thought of that. He's a king I, of being retarded. I don't want to talk. I don't want to talk about Pitt. You know, but, no, we don't. But, but I that's will, a fact. I will, I will say this: is that, um, Mitch Trubisky, Damn. the team that, that could be played, a worse offense got higher though. By the way, Just to get someone team, real quick, I, I, I'm trying to remember Mitch Mitch's coach down in North Carolina at the time. I don't know if it was. I don't know who it was at the time. I got nothing, Bob. He's been through so many bad coaches in his life, though, that... McDermott wasn't. McDermott's a great offensive coach. Okay. Up in Buffalo. Also, he had Nagy, so, yeah. Right. <laughs> Nagy's, Nagy offsets... That's, that's my that's other McDermott. reason for, for, for people who want to say get rid of Tomlin. You have a Hall of Fame coach here. The likelihood of okay. not getting someone horrible is very low. You're I not getting someone that. better than him. I will give that to you, and I've always given that to you, is that the level of replacement coaches is not at the level at to which Tomlin is at. No, he, he but, would have to step down three tiers to get to that level. But that's but that's the but this is the this is the no consequence issue that I'm talking about. Is that as a as a as an organization in general for the Steelers over the last 10 years, mm -hmm. there is a brand of loyalty that the fans have and the brand of loyalty that the ownership has to particular people, particular, you know, ways of doing things. And that as, as things are revealed that things are not actually good, there is a really hard time for people to let go that this is actually happening. This is a moment. This is a pivotal moment. This is changing. This is actually, and this well, is not even a, this is not an analytical standpoint. This is just a purely human standpoint that, that when you have such a belief in something, that something needs to go a certain way, that you are less likely to give in when a new option or something new is presented to you. And the reason that I, the reason that I, the reason that I say this is because Kenny Pickett with Pat Narduzzi, there is a different level of coaching that Pat Narduzzi has um, where Kenny Pickett was in that system for, you know, I, I how many years was he in that system? Pretty decent amount of years, right? Um, the way that the, he grew up understanding the way that a coach wants you to do something. You didn't have to go from coach to coach to coach to coach. Mitchell Trubisky is probably a, back to our freedom example is probably afraid to go off the decisions and do things against what is actually a bad yeah, afraid or life. not doesn't make your arm weak um i'm talent i'm not saying talent wise i'm saying decision making i'm saying in your head is that can can trubisky or could he have played better talent yes. wise Absolutely. Could he have made better decisions? Absolutely. Probably. He made faster decisions. Um, but this, but but the but the point remains is that when you when you when you couple all of this together, it's a top down approach. It goes from it, it goes from your if your coaching and your if your head coach is not giving consequences or whatever, and your and your offense coordinator is not doing anything, and then your quarterbacks come in, and it's and it's okay, I'm going to go here, and then Kenny Pickett comes in. You're going to destroy him. That's my fear. You're going to destroy him with a bad coach, bad decision-making. Tomlin needs to step up and say, I know we don't have a better option right now than Matt Canada, but – and that's it. He needs yeah, no, I got you. I, I think you're right. You know, at the end of the day here, A, there's no way to know – if that is and like I said, I'm not in the organization, so we don't need to know. We we don't know what's going and, on. And nor should it really, no, nor should it be made presented. Um, I, I I agree with that part of Tom. That's why I really like about him that he doesn't make it presented. The other part of this is that, as you said before, we have that human nature of seeing what we want to see. Unlike most people in life, Tomlin actually has earned his through wins. He has earned his through results. He has a crazy winning percentage. He has what the the second most wins of any active coach. 
I mean, he, something, he has produced crazy. it. And um, at the end of the day, we also have to keep in perspective here that it's not – we're not even talking about career at this point. We're only four games in. You know, we're a quarter of the way into the season. Is it looking like a good foundation right now? No. And it's not since TJ got hurt. Um, and, and on the defense, uh, we really have have had a lot of problems here because they're putting Liao, who actually looked really good um, as, as a run stuffer, but he has no pass rush. He mm-hmm. definitely cannot do it from the edge. Um, Highsmith missed three sacks that were in his hands um, yesterday where Zach Wilson just wiggled himself out. And, you know, at the end of the day, the defense did was handed a lead in two of our losses. We had a lead against New England and we had a lead against and we had a lead against um, the Jets. It happened last year, too. It happened last year, too, is that but you are when you are built around a good defense and your defense gives up a lead or gives up something that and it goes wrong is and you depend on that defense to not make any mistakes or make as minimal mistakes as possible, you're setting yourself up for failure. Yeah, that, that's why, and, and this this goes back to early, any coach really, the best defenses ever are the ones that aren't on the field. It, it's as straightforward as that. And, and in reality, I'm, I'm getting a little embarrassed going off to the Steelers here for a minute. That is why the Niners defense is in trouble. Um, they're being on the field a lot, and they're being on the field way too much. Um, it's my, it's the one thing that could derail Miami's defense is bridge Teddy two gloves. Um, but at the end of the day here, it's true for any team. Best defenses have a very strong running game next to them. Tennessee's defense is not more talented man for man than the Steelers, even without Watt. but Tennessee's defense is on the field for five less minutes, five less minutes translates to a lot of yardage and a lot of opportunities mm-hmm. of failure doesn't exist yeah because so, it minimizes your mistakes you can't make a mistake when you're on the bench and, and at the end of the day that mentality while very good for a defense um is kind of where our offense is at you can't yell at me if i didn't do anything crazy well you were hired here to do things innovative so mm-hmm. what, what what are you well doing? it's the same it's the same issue with justin fields in chicago right now is that he Justin and Fields I, is the doomsday scenario that we're trying right. to avoid. But I think this is I think this is interesting. I think he said something like, you know, like, oh, uh, I think I read a little thing. It was like, oh, you know, you say we don't have a good off or uh, that you say that, you know, he had like the the stat line on Fandle was like the lowest. It was the lowest quarterback passing yards in like a game. He goes, oh, but we're winning. This is the problem that the Steelers had last year is that the things that were going bad were lessened because they were winning. No, that's 100% true. Um, And and now that they're not winning, it's looking worse. But this was started last year. We have a perfect storm of perception hitting us right now. Obviously, the tape looks very bad. And we're about to roll into the four hardest games of our schedule. But yet I'll sit there every Sunday with the jersey on and I'll say, let's go Steelers. You know, really, I mean, you know, it's it's one, it's, you get one miracle win in Buffalo. This entire conversation, it's not going to happen. But I also don't think we're going to be as bad as Tennessee was up there either. Um, And I don't think so, but. The weaknesses of Buffalo's defense cannot be exposed by the Steelers. They couldn't be exposed by Trubisky. See, here's the thing. The receiving core is fast. They just drop the ball a lot. So what do you want? People who can get open but can't bring it home or people that can bring it home but can never get open? Because it, neither one's a good option. You don't option. want any of them. You don't yeah, want any you, of them. Exactly. So really, what you want is Muth. He is the one who's getting open and bringing it in. Um we, we, we need to have more separation man for man across the board, and we need to be attacking more of the quadrants on every play. You know, mm-hmm. you, you break the break the field into your phone digit, three, three, and three going across, and you should have a guy in four of those quadrants at a given point should be covered. You never should have two people in the same box. And that was the interception against Muth that happened. It's been happening a lot that that just makes the plays untenable. And 
if you if you have a bad offensive line, you need to give every advantage you can to your skill guys. And efficiency drawn up is because it's not like people are jamming us. Like the defense isn't even doing things risky to try to stop us. You know, when you're seeing people trying to stop Kansas City, they're jamming Kelsey, and sometimes it works, and you can get in Mahomes' face. But mm-hmm. normally, Kelsey just whips you around like a rag doll, and it's 20 yards later, oh, next play. Um, so we're not forcing the defense to do anything hard. We're hurting ourselves, and it is getting beyond frustrating. Well, I mean, uh, the team players out there, we're, we're out of time. But um, we do – this is this is the type of stuff that we want to get into on our show, right? We want to mm-hmm. talk to people who are passionate. We want to talk to people that – want to want their team to succeed whether it's succeeding or not succeeding we want to hear from you we want to get your thoughts and opinions we've got a lot of um people lined up for interviews over the next um couple of weeks here um we're hoping to put out a couple more shows within the next um next two weeks i think it is um stay tuned for the strategies of football joe's been uh really analyzing a lot of tape um Stay tuned for our DFS Still show. Jets, baby. It's coming. <laughs> Stay tuned for our DFS show on um, on Fridays. Mm-hmm. And um, support, um, like us, like this page. Follow us on Twitter. Follow us on um, Instagram. We haven't been posting a lot of Instagram. But, you know, it's always good to get a follow here and there. Um, and click the like and subscribe here on YouTube as well. Exactly. Be with you on the next one, guys.